for more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. Today, October 9th, is the anniversary of the assassination of Che Guevara. Che Guevara was in Bolivia, where he was killed on 9th of October, 1967. On this day, almost 20 publishing houses from Bharati Putakalam in Tamil Nadu, India, to Expressa Popular in Brazil, are releasing two texts of Che Guevara, his letter to the Tricontinental and Socialism and Man in Cuba. They will come free as ebooks in about 20 languages. As part of the launch of this book, People's Dispatch is very happy to be joined by Professor Helen Yaffe from the University of Glasgow. Helen, welcome to People's Dispatch. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Um, well, I thought immediately that we must talk to you because the first book you wrote, Helen, which is you know called Che Guevara, The Economics of the Revolution, is perhaps the most significant book that introduces us to Che Guevara as the institution builder, as the communist who built a revolution, and not just the legend of Albert Corda's photograph. So Helen, could you walk us through a little bit of Che, the communist, Che, the institution builder? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, Che was an incredibly multifaceted person. He um, had a, a concept, a, a certain approach to analysing the world and his sur surroundings, which arguably could be formed by his training as a medic. So not seeing the separate parts uh, distinctly, but seeing, you know, the sort of metabolism as a whole. And um, it's very interesting how early Che Guevara was thinking about the process of transition that the revolutionaries would have to go through after they had seized power, well before Batista was defeated. So um, when Che's column arrived at the Escambre Mountains in 1958, he sent a message to, uh, via the, the um, PSP, the Socialist um, Party of Cuba, that, or known as the Communist Party, that he required books about the Cuban economy. He was already thinking about that transition process. And then it's probably better known that when he arrived with his troops, victorious, Batista had fled, they arrived at La Cabana military fortress um, in early January 1959. He immediately set up a workshops in La Cabana, um, convinced the young rebel army soldiers, many of them from very poor peasant backgrounds, many of them uh, illiterate. He convinced them of the necessity of um, enrolling in education and learning basic literacy in order to be able to learn, um, you know, education for production, political education and education as culture. And he did what he could to convince them that actually, although the, the, the revolution was won, the real battle for control of Cuba was just beginning. So, um, yeah, Che was involved in all sorts of aspects of the transition process, particularly in the very tumultuous years between 1959 and 1961, before Cuba is um, declared by Fidel Castro to be building socialism. He was involved in military campaigns, um, in establishing the intelligence services, and in promoting overseas revolution. Some of that is better known about, but he was also involved on the political level with trying to bring together youth organizations um, in Cuba to create the what today is the uh, um, Union of Young Communists, it was first rebel youth organization, and he was involved in the talks to forge together the free armed revolutionary organizations that had taken part in the struggle in the 1950s to uh, create one united party. And that's on the political and, economic and military aspect. On the economic aspect, um, I've already mentioned he was interested in um, how this transition should take place. And he immediately began to work with people who were revolutionaries who knew all about the sugar industry. Because, of course, 
the whole of Cuban economy and Cuban life, politics, social, socioeconomic situation was dominated by the sugar industry, but also Che was very clear that this was an expression of US imperialism in Cuba. And um, so he was immediately thinking about how they could tackle this situation. And Che went quite early on, on he, first of all, he went in 1959 in summer, he went on a, what was called a goodwill mission to uh, numerous countries in the, which later became known as the non-aligned countries. So um, he traveled around countries in um, Egypt and uh, actually Yugoslavia, which was part of that sector, India and elsewhere. And he um, came back convinced of the importance of building domestic industry for Cuba. And um, during the trip, one of the people who was with him was a, um, a maths professor, Salvador Villaseca, and he said to um, Villaseca during the trip, when we get back, you must teach me maths. And Villaseca said, you know, I thought he was joking with the amount of work that would face him and his role in, in government, but a few days, uh, shortly after arriving back in Cuba, he contacted Villaseca and said, right, I will be waiting for you at seven in the morning for, for my maths class. And Jay um, ended up proceeding from maths to higher maths and all sorts of complex maths until Villaseca said, I can teach you no more. Um, the same situation happened when Che realised the um, importance of uh, automation and, and computing and set himself the task of learning cybernetics. So he was reading a cybernetics book one week ahead of his peers and he was sitting down and giving them a lesson. So he saw that computing was something that would be very important in the future. So Che came back from that trip and um, began a job as a uh, minister of industries, the first ever minister of industries in Cuba, a country which was dominated, as I said, by the sugar industry. Um, and Che was almost simultaneously um, named as the president of the National Bank. So he left his deputy, Orlando Borrego, who was a, a, a great person who I interviewed extensively, uh, spoke to extensively for my research. Orlando Borrego was left at the Ministry of Industries while Che was in the National Bank. And they were in those key positions when the nationalizations took place and basically the shift from what you could call a free enterprise, semi-colonial um, economy to an economy under a state plan where 85% of industry was in the state's hands and the state ends up with a monopoly on financial institutions, banks and so on. So Jay was really key in that process of transition. He had a very clear vision of the direction that Cuba needed to go into. He was very clear, and remember he had his experience of being in Guatemala during the coup against Jacques Barbens, that it was necessary to dismantle the old state and build a new one. And he also developed, um, as you know, a critique of the economic management system operating in the Soviet Union at that time, a critique of the Soviet or socialist political economy that prevailed at that time. Um, he was very concerned about the impact of um, the clamour for opening up more spaces to market mechanisms and to use more tools of capitalism. He called them the dull tools of capitalism. And he was, he had a vision, as I said, a holistic vision of what socialism meant. And he said, you know, communism, socialism is not just an economic fact. It's not just a question of um, announcing that workers are in control of the factory instead of a private owner. It is a question of um, a transfer of real power to the working class, but also a change in consciousness and a change in values and social relations. And as the Minister of Industries, and this is the focus of my book, which um, you just held up there, he set himself the task of um, answering this very tricky question. It's very simple to, to pass a policy. It's one thing to say we must now have a different consciousness and, and we are now the owners of production. But what actual um, mechanisms can you use to change the way that people 
think to change their social relations and to make workers actually feel um, or know that they are in control of production and that they change their concept, having worked for years by selling their labor power as a commodity, how do workers then come to a place where work is seen as a social duty and they identify their individual effort with social development? So these were some of the very complex tasks which Che set himself, and I, um, I, you know, wanted to find out what did he do because there were some great books already, like Carlos Tablada's book on the economic and political transformation, um, in Cuba. But there was much less detail about how he actually went about about this endeavor. Um, and also, you know, I'd read the, uh, the the big fat John D. Anderson biography that came out along with many other books on the 30th anniversary of Che's death in 1997. And, you know, had great detail about Che and his um, escapades and his adventures as a ch child and teenager, his travels in Latin America, and then subsequently as a guerrilla fighter in um, Africa and in Bolivia. But when it came to the section about what Che was doing as a member of the Cuban government for six years, there was almost nothing. I mean, there were comments like, you know, Che's light was seen on at four in the morning, but I wanted to know what was Che doing at four in the morning? And I found out, I had some really fantastic stories. So one of them, I was um, interviewing uh, someone who had been a young man and he was in charge of accounts at a um, enterprise, state enterprise producing flour. And at two o'clock in the morning, he had a knock at the door and he was told that Che would like to see him. There was obviously an issue with some of the accounts he'd submitted it Che wanted to see him in his office at four in the morning. He got there at four in the morning and um, uh, he found Che standing there leaning on the corner of a metal cabinet which he pulled out. And he said to Che, Comandante, but why are you standing in this uncomfortable position? Remember, it was four in the morning. And Che said to him, because if I don't make myself uncomfortable, I'll fall asleep. And I have these reports to read before the um, council, uh, the management council meeting at seven in the morning. So, yeah, it was um, incredible to, to see the multifaceted elements of this man and also to hear the very sort of rich human stories of the people, the men and women who worked very closely with Che. Um, the sort of unsung heroes of the revolution. And I feel that in a way, uh, my book turned out to be as much their history as it was Che Guevara's. No, no question. No question, Helen, that it's a story of, um, of a lot of people, not only Che, but Che leading them. I mean, you're right that John Lee Anderson and others emphasize parts of Che, which is the legendary Che. In fact, even the Motorcycle Diaries is a misnamed book because the motorcycle collapsed in Chile. <laughs> and he didn't actually go by motorcycle, you know, up to Colombia. And then eventually he flies to the United States, which is, you know, fascinating stuff. But the motorcycle was only the first leg from, you know, Rosario out to across the end. You know, they finally get, it's hardly defines, every, but Che is the legend. There's something that you raise, which Che struggles with, which very briefly, if you could talk a little bit, you, you indicated it just now. This is the question of incentives. Um, one of the things that a socialist society is often attacked for is the question of incentive. And, and Che, I found in your book and reading Che himself, he was very sensitive about how to move from material incentives, as you say, selling your labor power, and then earning a wage, and then trying to earn a better wage, et cetera, et cetera. Material incentive, how to change to moral incentive or to a socialist incentive. So could you talk a little bit about Che's experiments with different forms of incentives uh, for a society? So yeah, I mean, this is a key question because a lot of people, including on the left, have totally mischaracterized Che's promotion of uh, the new man and woman or Che's promotion of voluntary labor as if it was just a sort of mechanism for getting people out to work harder. In fact, it was very much integral to his analysis or his appreciation for Marx's analysis of 
the commodification of labor. So, you know, if how do you undermine the commodification of labor? Well, people have to be in a situation where they give their labor willingly as part of the social product, um, which they are the, you know, collective owners of. So it's a, that's the, the combination between consciousness and, and social relations. Um, the voluntary labor thing is interesting because it starts with a sort of national campaign um, over the sugar harvest. And that is a result of very rapid changes that are implemented. So pre-revolution, you have something like 400,000 Cubans paid a very low wages for the hardest work imaginable under the searing Caribbean sun, working with machetes in the sugarcane harvest. And the harvest lasts for about four months of the year. And then after that is known as El Tiempo Muerto, the dead season, because literally people were left with very little alternative means of living. So what happens is the revolution guarantees people jobs, it puts them in education, it builds them homes. And so it takes away the, the um, um, things that force them into these, uh, what Che called slave-like conditions. And in fact, you know, slavery was traditionally in Cuba operated by, um, sorry, the sugar plantations were traditionally operated by slavery until late in the 19th century. So when they do that, um, there's an exodus away from the sugar plantations and they have a labor scarcity. So uh, voluntary labor becomes a national mechanism for getting people to the field at the time of the harvest and to harvest the cane. I mean, incidentally, they did find that sometimes it wasn't so helpful because people with no training or experience could cut the cane in a, in a counterproductive way and so on. But um, actually, it was um, a man called Orlando Borrego, who was one of the people I, again, repeatedly interviewed, um, who was the first person to implement the idea, he, it, it is said, in his own, uh, in the enterprise which he administered. And um, that was an initiative, he came up with the workers themselves, and Che went and visited, uh, I should say that every week, all of the members of the management board of the Ministry of, of Industries um, had to go and visit a factory or a workshop or a, an, another productive entity and do carry out what they called a factory visit and write a full report and this was their very much their way of keeping in touch with uh, the workers keeping a, uh, their hand on the pulse of the workers and talking to them face to face in every corner of Cuba and Che saw the work that this guy Amhel Arcos was doing um, and said this is a great idea why don't we try to expand it. So voluntary labor took off through the Ministry of Industries and Construction and, and, and in workplaces and so on. Um, and they developed, you know, the, the, the administrators were given quite a bit of freedom to develop in different incentives. Um, so they might have a sort of newsletter with worker of the week and so on, like looking for non-material incentives. And they also might have, um, you know, to, to discourage in discipline absentee of the week where they would say this person missed five shifts but they wouldn't say the name and everyone would gather around and, and work out see if they could work out who it was and no one wanted to be that person so you know people stepped up and so on and they had awards in within the ministry for um you know best improvements and best output and so on so they experimented a lot and Che was not dogmatic there's a there's a lot of material um, I was fortunate enough to get access to the internal manuscript, manu, um, sorry, internal transcript of their um, management meetings, their bi-monthly meetings of the industry where all the directors and administrators were. And that was some 400 people. And it was Che very much free talking with them. Um, you see Che in every different sort of expression of himself. So there's, there's Che sort of griping and complaining, and you know, why is it always up to me? Why do I have to solve these problems? You lot should be going out and getting to the room. And then there's Che sort of inspiring, you know, rallying, mobilizing, falling. Um, so, you know, and everything in between and just discussions. And I had access to that material. And, and you can see that, you know, Che said, you've got a good idea, let's try it. If it doesn't work, we'll get rid of it, we'll try something else. And even with his budgetary finance system, 
which was this unique system of economic management which Che developed within the budget uh, within the Ministry of Industries, even in the um, you know his his article on the budgetary finance system, he says, let's try it, let's try something new, let's try to carry out the construction of socialism, the transition to socialism, with a, a different form that fits Cuba. Let's see if we can solve some of the problems that we criticise in the Soviet Union. Um, let's see if we can do it with more worker engagement, with um, a, a change in consciousness, you know, parallel to the change in productivity. Um, and they experimented, and you know, it has to be said, Fidel Castro was well aware and gave Che the institutional and political space that he needed to, to experiment. So yeah, I mean, there were some fascinating um, a, De fascinating procedures and, and ideas developed. You see, Helen, I have to say that generally when you have a legendary figure like Che Guevara, and you know, who doubts the great legend of Che, when you go behind the legend, one is disappointed. <laughs> one of the things that you have produced is, you know, your book actually enhances for people like me the legend of Che, because we see Che here grappling with the genuine contradictions of building a socialist society. And, and it's so important for us as we, you know, try to advance an agenda, um, you know, to make the world a better place, to learn about not, you know, the, the legend that inspires you abstractly, but the legend that teaches you about, you know, these meetings where you have to, on the one side, be despondent about your comrades and why aren't you doing things? And on the other side, inspirational for your comrades, because isn't that what building a new society is about, being despondent and inspirational really at the same time? It's not enough to just be inspirational. Uh, you're a human being. Uh, I want to end here for us with a question I want to ask you, Helen. We are thinking of making October 9th, the day of the assassination of Che Guevara, um, the international day to abolish the CIA. And I wanted your reaction to this new idea of the international day to abolish the CIA. <laughs> well, I mean, um, you've picked this day because of the uh, CIA. Well, Felix Rodriguez, who was a, a Cuban who had um, participated in the Bay of Pigs invasion and subsequently was an operative for the CIA for his role in um, executing Che. But quite frankly, given the history of the CIA, <laughs> it's just in Latin America. I think you could probably pick any one of 365 days because really, you know, when you teach on Latin America, um, the, the CIA's role, uh, and, and I'm saying that in America, but globally, and you know, what what is shocking, I think, is that actually, after a certain amount of time, the documents are made available. And yet, you know, there is really no um, accountability, there is really no change in behaviour. So, um, by all means, you know, anything that highlights uh, the CIA's role, um, I think that, you know, let's not forget the, the um, role played by the British in their colonies um, and, and, uh, and elsewhere. So uh, I think, you know, every capitalist state have um, institutions and structures which are there to protect their interests. And clearly the, C the CIA represents the um, most powerful uh, capitalist country, but I think we could, we could all look at our own states. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us at People's Dispatch. This is, um, you know, been a very enlightening and important conversation. We're going to, uh, of course, give the link to the free downloadable text, uh, two essays by Che Guevara. Um, this is all, of course, part of the International Week of Anti-Imperialist Actions, and um, really happy to talk to you, Helen. We'll have to come back and talk about your new book. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.